Arnold Schwarzenegger in one of his lines, he says about the human race, it's in your nature to destroy yourselves. This is the Talent Show, a new podcast series from FT Talent, a hub of innovation from the Financial Times, hosted by under 30s for the under 30s around the world. This first series is in partnership with Bocconi University, a leading higher education institution of business and managerial advancements. I am Virginia Stagni, and this is the guide you need to drive innovation and change. Today, we're focusing on global finance by talking with an expert whose research includes corporate governance and social responsibility. This is for any listener who is fascinated by the powerful forces in finance and wishes to have the curtain pulled back on how they operate. Here is our conversation with Hannes Wagner, professor of finance at Bocconi University. Welcome to our new episode. We have Professor Wagner that is joining us today. How are you, Hannes? How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. How are you, Virginia? Um, very good. So we're talking about finance with you. Uh, Hannes, I would be super interested in understanding how did you first develop an interest in the world of finance? Um, what's your personal journey? I would say, you know, for first interest in finance, I, I never found finance interesting when I was in school. So, you know, I, I wasn't one of those, yeah, that, that's what I want to do. No, I, I didn't find finance interesting at all. But I remember then being an undergraduate student and I was sitting in my first microeconomics lecture and I thought that was just amazing. It was amazing stuff. It, it felt that I was being given superpowers uh, in the sense that, you know, for the first time I understood how markets work and why people operate in these markets, why they do the things that they do. And then over time, I think I came to appreciate that my taste for economic settings was really strongest when those settings were actually financial settings. As a profession, I would say finance is just incredibly interesting. That's how I would summarize it. That's very interesting because we have to think about the world of finance and what the Financial Times is all about is giving a better understanding of the world of finance of global market. The most related to your knowledge is to the real world and most of the time you're going to have financial settings or at least, you know, some business behind the scenes that you need to discover. So you work a lot in the world of ESG research and ESG investing in terms of trying to understand better how this ESG world is structured. There has been quite a lot of debate over whether the investments aimed at social good can also be profitable. Do you think this is something that actually can work? Do you think these aims can go together or are naturally at odds? Profitability versus social good. Profitability versus social good. I was a few days ago actually teaching a course to a large group of young investment bankers. Uh, it was a session on CSR or you know ESG. Uh, so let's call it sustainability. And we were discussing exactly that, the connection between profitability and sustainability. And one point that I tried to drive home a few days ago was I said, you know, please resist the temptation to get people interested in sustainability by showing that it's profitable. Because maybe ESG or sustainability or CSR is profitable. It is, this is what the academic evidence is showing. You know, it's, it's very likely profitable in some very specific settings, but it's very much less clear in many other settings of whether, you know, you make more money, the same amount of money, less amount of money. But the important point here is we cannot stop being interested in sustainability in the unpleasant case. It turns out that it's actually not profitable. Why? We can't afford to do this because the planet is not going to kind of save itself, for example, from climate change. And there is a lot of empirical evidence, which is another very important point, that people, without giving them anything, deeply care about sustainability, especially if they're younger rather than, than older. So people don't really need the financial argument. 
you're probably all very familiar with the example, what happens when you have altruistically motivated people that donate blood just because they try to do the right thing and you start paying people for giving blood. What happens is that they give less blood in the future. Why? Because you've managed to destroy their altruistic motivation and replace it with a financial one that is much less powerful. This reference on the blood donation, it made me think about a book when I was studying a bit of anthropology in my business studies. There is one thing that I highly suggest our listeners to check out, the Essay sur le Don, or the Essay on the Giving and the Gift, where an anthropologist, Marcel Maus, talks about the connection between blood donation and what happens in our society when we stop donate and actually we make people paid for that gift. There is actually a whole anthropological view around that. Highly suggested to check it out. Super curious and super nice. Check the show notes for that. I think finance and ESG is quite correlated to performance and how companies can perform in the future or not, depending on their sustainability behavior. When I'm approaching this and I'm trying to analyze the ESG case, Mm -hmm. I understand that that, of course, is important for people to care. But how do we, from a business perspective, make people extra care? I'm talking about boardrooms. Have you seen any cases or anything that would be interesting to analyze here in terms of the importance of the financial push to really make things happen? You know, first to clarify, I'm not against the financial incentives at all. My impression is that the way that practitioners feel about the existing evidence that we have, whether, you know, sustainability is actually financial beneficial or not, and the way that academics interpret that very same evidence that we have, there seems to be a relatively large gap in the sense that finance professionals tend to be pretty convinced that you can establish a great positive and causal correlation between sustainability and potentially financial better performance. I think academics who have less of a dog in the fight because we have less invested here, I think we are looking at the evidence a lot more skeptically. I think very few academics would say, you know, yes, I'm very convinced that there is a strong positive and causal, very important. It's not just a correlation, but it's a causal correlation. By being more sustainable, you perform better. I I think most of us would say, yeah, you know, maybe in in some circumstances as before, but but, broadly speaking, let's be careful. I'm worried about the idea of overselling the financial benefits Because indeed, there is the strong likelihood that we may realize those financial benefits are more muted. And it would be terrible if then people become less interested in an idea because you have kind of cheated them because the data were inconclusive. And now that you know better, it turns out, you know, oh, now we don't care about uh, CSR and sustainability anymore. So that risk I'm worried about. I'm very happy if the positive relationship exists. I just worry what if it doesn't, then you don't want to lose the interests of those boardrooms. Corporate social responsibility. You have been, of course, looking as well on the bad side of finance. And here it's where I get overly interested in your job and your research. So you focus on the CSR as well as bad actors. You have been looking at uh, the Panama Papers, for example. Would you say the dark side dominates in finance or the bright side? Hmm. Do I get depressed as a researcher when I look at the dark side of finance? So as a researcher, you know, I analyze the Panama Papers and I find that people use offshore tax havens and they use them to lie and to cheat and to steal. Then I find that those that cheat and steal, the dictators, the drug lords, the corrupt politicians, the dishonest executives and so on and so on, they are being helped by some of the top financial firms around the world and also other professional service firms to maybe not just single out finance. Then we know or we establish that a whole industry caters to these criminals or let's call them you know, more carefully unethical clients. And this industry we call the enablers and maybe some of them have their offices, which are very nice offices, literally 
a few meters from your office in Bracken House in London, right? Is that depressing? Yes, it is depressing, but it's probably not surprising. You can tell that I am over 30 years old uh, since I was in high school when the James Cameron movie that maybe you remember, you know, Terminator 2 came out in 1991. And in the movie, Arnold Schwarzenegger, in one of his lines, he says about the human race, it's in your nature to destroy yourselves. And he's not a philosopher. And someone wrote that line, so it would sound good in a movie. But of course, it's also true. The dark side is strong. I don't think it dominates in finance, but it is strong. I think the important point here is this is not specific, I believe, to finance. It's just a human trait. And yes, unfortunately, it is in our nature to destroy ourselves. So, you know, Schwarzenegger is right to some degree. But let's also remember that the vast majority of people working in finance are not helping some terrible person to hide their money somewhere in the UK, ideally in real estate in downtown London. No, the vast majority of jobs in finance exist to facilitate that if someone wants to buy a home, it's a normal home, and they can obtain financing to do so. And that someone with an idea, you know, to make it very practical, how to create a vaccine against COVID, and their idea is better than all the other ideas, that they can raise money on public markets to build the lab and to hire the smart people that will help develop the vaccine and so on. So let's not get depressed. I'm not depressed. I think nobody should be depressed about finance. It's just because we are human, we screw up and we screw up frequently, but that's normal. And I think it's not specific to finance. In this podcast, we focus on business issues, of course, but also issues that touch on society and philosophy. I was thinking about the famous Nietzsche quote from his book, The Antichrist. Man is the most bungled of all the animals, the sickliest, and not one has strayed more dangerously from its instincts. We often destroy ourselves given our greed and desire for success. I mean, isn't this quite the typical stereotype that we see in movies as Scorsese's Wolf of Wall Street or Stone's Wall Street of the successful financial guy, the person that becomes rich while losing their moral core? You have been doing a lot of research around that, on the evil side of finance. I would love you to talk about whether you think this greed is inevitable and possibly something financial firms should be agnostic about in terms of simply work and maximize profits for your clients. BlackRock, PayPal have recently earned both praise and criticism for pushing a more hands-on approach to making decisions about the morals of their clients. Should the financial firms have a deontology to only work with clients that they believe are morally good? I'm not sure, you know, whether I'm qualified to speak on behalf of the finance profession here. I would say society seems to have decided that this is not how in finance we should treat clients and customers. This is, you know, why the financial industry is so heavily regulated. One reason for that is there are certain ways that society has decided are uncomfortable for finance to work. There are certain benefits that can be enabled by finance and society has decided, and probably we have collectively decided, these benefits should rather not be generated. Examples might be the financial sanctions that the vast majority of countries uh, have imposed on Russia. This is an expression of the will of societies whether finance professionals would agree with this, and maybe they do, isn't necessarily very important because regulation says there are certain things that you should definitely not do. Then those are the rules and you either play by them or you are no longer a legal financial player. What should a financial professional be able to cover how deep they should go into the technical side. Of course, we said a bit of understanding of coding, but can you elaborate a bit more about that so we can give suggestions to our listeners here? Let me try to make this very concrete. It's hard to know what is the skill set that you should go for. What are the things that people will expect you to be able to do? What I typically suggest to my students is to do an exercise as follows. 
We know that the skill set is changing first, but second, we also know that the people that are doing the job that you have in mind today probably have skill sets that are pretty suitable for those jobs, at least right now. The skills will be similar even in five years time or, or in 10 years time. So the exercise that I usually suggest is very simple and very scary. Please go to LinkedIn or a platform like LinkedIn and identify 10 people that are alive and that are doing the dream job that you are considering right now saying, hey, you know, if I'm doing that job in 10 years time, then things have gone really well in my life. And the, the only constraint is I'm asking you, please constrain this set of 10 people to people that live within a one hour travel radius of where you live. Okay. And then because this is the hardest part, you have to contact them and you have to explain who you are and that you would like to meet them face to face. This is the hardest part. This is very intimidating and several people, we know what will happen. Several people will blow you off when you do this. You say, hey, I'm, who are you? I don't know who you are, fine. But I guarantee that when you make the effort to seek out real people that exist, and have a human conversation face to face, not on FaceTime, I guarantee you will learn a huge amount about yourself, about your future goals and about those skills that you mentioned, Virginia, from this exercise. And I love this exercise because it gives us also a bit of hope to the people that might not get an answer from these experts. So thank you so much, Hanessa, for sharing this because it's really making us a bit grounded on things to do and how to approach this. And we love this pragmatic approach on the talent show. Just to be sure about being pragmatic, students coming up right now may suffer from a job market that is definitely affected by central banks that are raising their rates to cool off the economy. So how do you suggest students understand these forces that will affect their lives and what they should be doing? Well, this is a tough topic. It's a difficult question. I think there is no doubt that students are entering now or are about to enter a job market that is probably going to be significantly colder than we might have uh, hoped it to be. I think the same rules apply in the economic downturn. And now a lot suggests that the economic downturn is coming or maybe we are already in it. The same rules always apply, which is as the market gets more difficult, the specific skills that you have in order to outcompete all those other people that are now looking for those cars or jobs, just have to be stronger than everybody else's skills. You have to make better impression than everybody else. Yes, it's, it's unfortunate to go potentially to the market during those times, but embrace it. It's, it's not, you know, in any way special. You better work very hard to stand out on whatever dimension it is that you actually have a chance of standing out. Maybe it's your social intelligence. Maybe it's your math skills. Maybe it's your creativity. Maybe it's your coding skills. Maybe it's that you are faster in understanding stuff than everybody else. But it has to be something because those rising interest rates mean exactly one thing. There are going to be more competitors for you. So, you know, don't complain, don't whine, embrace the competition and go for it. I think this is the advice that has always been applying in downturns. And this time, I fear, will unfortunately be no different. Thank you so much, Professor Wagner. And uh, now we have uh, our core part of the talent show that is uh, welcoming students from all over the world, our challengers, to ask a question directly to our expert. So we have uh, with us uh, Rucha and Joshua. Rucha, over to you. Hello, my name is Rucha Deshpande. I was a participant of the FT Talent Challenge in 2022. I'm from India, but currently living in Boston. I'm doing my master's in financial analytics from Bentley University. My question to Professor Hans Wagner is, do you think business schools are successfully recalibrating their programs to adapt to the growing integration of technology and finance? Thank you, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks a lot, Rucha. My answer is, you know, are business schools successfully recalibrating? Yes and no. We, so the business schools, 
we face the same challenge as everybody else. How to integrate finance and technology? Who teaches those blockchain courses, you know, those machine learning courses, those very applied courses potentially that give you data handling skills and so on? I teach some of those courses, parts of those courses myself, and I'm probably okay since I've always loved the integration of technology into my work. So I would say, you know, all business schools are struggling more or less successfully to hire those people with those skills, not least struggling because we are competing with finance firms and computer firms and, and social media firms. So I would say, yes, business schools are managing, but you want to be very picky as a student and question, for example, who specifically is teaching that blockchain course, whether they have publications in top journals in that area or whether they are just pretending to be world-class experts and the school sells them to you. Thank you very much, Professor Wagner. Last question from Joshua. Hello, my name is Joshua. I was a participant of the FD Talent Challenge in 2021. I'm from Italy, where I currently live and study. I'm also working for the European Youth Parliament Italy. My question to Professor Hans Wagner is, how will higher interest rates and the widespread energy crisis affect the movement to ESG-friendly investments? Thanks, Joshua. I you know, want to make it black and white and not gray. Of course, they will be on net. They will be very bad, okay? Higher interest rates and an energy crisis are almost certainly going to be bad for ESG-friendly investments. We can pretend that this is not true, but it will probably be true. That would be my humble prediction. Think about it. If the electricity producer is running out of money and there is lots of cheap coal, to pick an example, well, then maybe we have to burn the coal since the electricity producer collapsing and the country experiencing blackouts would be even worse. So I find it you know, very difficult to imagine no much how I would like to sugarcoat it that you know, high interest rates and a widespread energy crisis almost certainly has to be bad for environmentally and socially friendly investments. Why? Because to some degree, at least, we won't be able to afford them quite as much as we were able to afford them before. So that's the bad news. And, um, you know, please don't shoot the messenger. This has been great. Thank you so much for being part of a talent show. I hope you enjoyed being on the show with us. Thank you very much and up to the next episode. Thank you, Virginia. It has been a great pleasure. Thank you so much for listening and tuning in. Check out our website, fttalent.ft.com, for any upcoming editions of our challenge. We are spreading our wings around the world. Check out for the next edition. Apply and be part of the Challenge Network. This has been the Talent Show, which is produced by the FT Talent Team, Aya Al-Shihabi, Noor Hafez, and me, Virginia Stani. Our podcast producer is Todd Van Luling. Our editor and sound engineer is Arturo Ochoa. Our video producer is Enrique Zecca. And our social media producer is Letizia Clementi. Our music is by Dennis Kishuk. Check out all of the Talent Show episodes at fttalent.ft.com. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow FT Talent on socials for updates. Until next time, and keep listening.